let's open up to Revelation 20, verse 11. And we have it's a pretty, pretty incredible little chunk of scripture this morning. Revelation 20, verse 11 through 15. We're calling this sermon the end. All right, let's read that together. Revelation 20, verse 11. John writes, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. From his presence, the earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books, according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one of them according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. So Jesus, we, we thank you for your word this morning. Lord, we, we want to humble ourselves right now. We want to open up your word, and we want to submit ourselves to what you say in it, God. Lord, we, we don't want to apologize for it, Lord. We want to read it with confidence, trusting that you spoke this. Lord, that this is God-breathed, that Holy Spirit. You inspired John in such a way that when we read these words, we are hearing the actual words of God. So, Lord, help us this morning. Help me, Lord, to communicate your word faithfully, Lord. Help, help all of us to, to listen. Give us ears to hear, Lord. I pray you would encourage us, Lord. I pray that you would wake some of us up, Lord. I pray for salvation this morning, God. I pray that you would, you would speak and minister to your church. You are the senior pastor. You speak and lead through your word, God. And so, we just want to, we want to submit to you this morning, God. Give us an excitement and just a, a hunger to hear from you this morning. And it's in Jesus' name we all said, amen. 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 Okay, so when you think about the end of the world, like what thoughts come to mind? Like if, if you were to write a book, like how you thought the end of the world would happen, what would you say? What would that entail? I, it's interesting, our, our world, our culture is totally infatuated with this, with the end of the world, right? We have constant movies and books, TV shows, post-apocalyptic stuff like Mad Max, in case you haven't heard, that's about the end of the world that's out right now. Hunger Games, we have like all kinds of stuff. Our culture loves thinking about the end of the world. It's interesting. It's interesting. And what's crazy is if you really think about it, like it's going to happen. Like the, the world is going to end. Like that's, that's crazy. The end is actually coming. Like when people are standing with a sign like the end is near, like they're actually right. They may be kind of crazy, but they're right. The end is actually coming. And what's unique about the church, though, what's unique about the Christians is we don't have to speculate. You know, we don't have to wonder, wonder what's going to happen. God is graciously, he's given us this book. And he's given us revelation, and he's given us an idea of what the end's going to look like. No, we don't know every single detail. We don't know how, you know, play by play, but we do know the ending. Like, we can have confidence that the world doesn't have because God has spoken, and he's encouraged us. We don't have to be afraid. We don't have to speculate. Like, we can trust. Yes, the end is coming, but, but Jesus is in control. And so this text this morning is literally... It's the end of the world, the universe as we know it. We know something else is coming and we're excited for that, but, but this text, the end of chapter 20 is literally, it's the last scene in the world that we know it. So let's, let's get started. Revelation 20, verse 11. And the first word, I'm reading out of the ESV, it's the same in the NASB, the first word is then. And let's just stop right there, then, okay? Just quick recap, then because what had just happened, let's refresh our minds, Satan was literally last week defeated once and for all, thrown into the lake of fire. No more Satan. Never again do we have to worry about Satan. Jesus just reigned for his thousand years, his millennial kingdom. He's defeated armies and nations rebelling against him. 
If you remember the false prophet and the beast who are leading people astray, they've been thrown into the lake of fire. If you remember Babylon the Great has been defeated. All the bulls and seals and trumpets of God's wrath have already been poured out. And now we have then, we have the last scene in the world as we know it. And, and John goes on to say in verse 11, then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away and no place was found for them. Okay, so literally at this scene, just imagine the earth and the sky, like they, they flee. They literally flee from the presence of God. That's a symbolic way of saying all of creation, the entire universe, literally somehow it's gone. It flees from the presence of God. Like the presence of God is everywhere and it says they flee and there was no place found for them. This, the, literally the universe is, is crumbling, it's falling apart, it's becoming undone. Just imagine that. Like that's better than any science fiction you could ever read. The universe flees, it runs away, right? And, and the Bible's talked about this. In 2 Peter, Peter was talking about this exact scene. He says, by the same word, the heavens and the earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. That's, what, that's where we have right now. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and the heavens will pass away with a roar. Just imagine that. And the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done in it will be exposed. Okay, so this is the end of civilization. This is the end of America. I mean, this is the end of McDonald's, it's the end of the internet, it's the end of cars, just like literally the end of everything we've ever experienced, it's done. And what's, what's interesting is, is our world kind of gets that this is going to happen. Like they, we have this infatuation about the end. We, we have these ideas, right? Is it going to be nuclear warfare and it's the end? Or maybe we're going to deplete all our resources and it's the end? Or maybe just a great war and we all kill each other and, and that's the end? The world kind of knows. The Bible says the, the, the word of God, the law is written on our hearts. We know that this day is coming. But, but there's something else happening in this scene that the world doesn't know about. There's something else happening in this scene that we can rest in and and look, at verse 11, it says, I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. And that's, that's Jesus seated on his throne. Okay, so everything is gone except for Jesus sitting on his throne. All, I mean, all throughout Revelation, we keep getting these glimpses of Jesus on his throne, right? Jesus is on his throne. Things are happening, but Jesus is on his throne, and what we can rest in is, yes, the end is coming, but it's not a nuke. Jesus brought about the end. Like The end is coming, but it wasn't in the hands of the nations or, or technology or global warming. It was in the hands of Jesus. Jesus is on his throne. Just let, let your heart rest in this, because when we talk about the end of the world, it's like, oh my gosh, the end of the world. We, we get this kind of anxiety, but we know Jesus will be seated on his throne, Listen to this psalm, Psalm 102, talk about this. It says, of old you laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will change them like a robe, and they will pass away, but you are the same, and your years have no end. Man, just, just to start off, let your heart just rest in those words. Nothing else is going to remain. The heavens aren't going to remain. Your job isn't going to remain. Your house isn't going to remain. Even your relationships as you know them now on earth, they're not going to remain. We're going to die. The end is coming. The planet as we know it is not going to remain. But do you know who remains? It's Jesus. Like, let your heart, your years have no end. You are the same. Jesus remains. And that, that banner is over the entire book of Revelation. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ, who is remaining, who is the same, the Alpha, the Omega, seated on his throne. And so as the end comes, let's just constantly remind ourselves, Jesus is on his throne. As the world continues to be crazy, just remind yourself, Jesus is on his throne. The end is in his hands. And then what is Jesus doing? So let's look at verse 12 and 13. 
Verse 12 and 13, it says, And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. And the books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books, according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. So just quick, kind of interpretive side note here. Again, as you know, as we've read Revelation, there's many different ways to interpret Revelation, right? It's, what exactly do, do these symbols mean? Is this symbolic? Is this literal? Is this the future? Is this now? And I just, I want us to know as, as we read this little chunk, 11 through 15, there's a couple different faithful interpretations of who exactly is standing at the throne right now, just so you know. So some people would say, some people in the church and church history have said, do you know what? This moment is the moment that all the entire, every single human who's ever lived is standing before the throne. They would say this is Christian standing and this is non-Christian standing. And then another perspective would say that, do you know, no, this is actually just unbelievers standing. Because if you remember, Jesus reigned for a thousand years and he came and he took his people, right? And then that was their moment of, of getting judged for their deeds and rewards and they were clothed in Jesus' righteousness and they ruled with Jesus. So some would say this is everybody. Some would say, do you know what? Christians are gone and this is just the world. But the important truth here is regardless of which one of these two perspectives you take, every, every perspective agrees that at some point, every, every human being will stand before Jesus. It doesn't matter if it was, you know, you're raptured and you're standing before Jesus before the world or if we're all there together. Regardless, every, I mean, think about this. Every one of us, every one of us will stand before Jesus on his throne and we will give an account for our life and the books will be open for all of us. I mean, every one of us. So just, just know that. And we're not going to really get into depth of, of which one of the two. Just know that that is true. We will all stand before God. And so verse 12 says, I saw the dead, great and small. And verse 13, the sea gave up the dead who were in it. So the dead will all be standing before Jesus. And Romans 14 talks about this. It says, for we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. And then it says the great and the small, right? It doesn't matter who you were in this life, you're gonna stand before Jesus. It doesn't matter if you were rich, it doesn't matter if you were poor, it doesn't matter if you were famous, it doesn't matter if you were so rich, you never had to do anything for yourself in this life, you will stand before Jesus. You don't get an assistant to stand before Jesus. Every human being will stand humbled before Jesus. And every human will bow their knee to Jesus. Every single one of us will be bowing before Jesus. And then it says, what are they doing there? They're standing before the throne, verse 12, and books were opened. It says, then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. Okay, so we have these interesting symbols. We have multiple books present, okay? So we have over here, we have some books, and then over here, we have the book of life. So the first is, is the books. It just calls it the books, okay? And, and in these books, it's literally, it's your life. It's the account of your life. From the day you were born to the day you died, it's everything you've ever thought, every intention of your heart, every sin against God, every good deed. This is in the books, and all of us are gonna give an account for that, for that books. And then over here, we have the book of life. Okay, we're gonna stand before God and those two things will be present. But this book, the book of life, it's a different kind of book. Okay, these books held an account of what you have done. And the book of life is an account of what God has done on your behalf. And that is good news. It is called the Lamb's book of life. This book existed, it said, before the creation of the world. Before God even created the universe, he knew he'd need this book. He knew he would send his son to die for sinners, and, and he actually wrote the names in that book before the earth was created. He wrote the names of those who would be rescued, filled with the names of those who've called upon the blood of Jesus to cover their sins. And, and this is pretty radical because no one makes it into heaven because of what's in these books. Your whole life, everything you've ever done, good or bad, this is not how you get into heaven. Everything you've ever done, every good deed, every bit of service, every bit of commitment, this doesn't have to do with heaven. This, the Lamb's book of life, is the only ticket. It's the only way you're going to enter into heaven. And then the last, the last thing to notice out of verses 12 and 13 this morning is 
Judgment is coming, but it's, it's coming on that day. Judgment is coming that final day. And you know, that's, that's good news for us because we tend to be judges, right? We tend to feel like, man, I got to make things right now. Like if, if someone has wronged me, I need to make it right today. If, if the world is unjust, I need to fix it right now. And so number one, let's just rest. We don't need to bear the, the burden of judgment. We don't. That's not our burden to bear. That's God's, and he's going to handle it on that day. We don't need to make things right. We don't need to seek justice for ourselves. I mean, think about that. You don't need to right every wrong that's been someone has done against you. I mean, let, let that be good news. Let it go. Like, trust Jesus with that justice. He's going to make things right one day. The good news that Jesus is going to judge the world is that we don't have to. We don't need that burden. And what else is good news for the world is we're not very good at it. We're not very good at being judges, but Jesus is. He is just and he's holy and he will judge rightly. Second, we can trust there will be, there will be justice one day, right? We, we maybe need to let it go, but we can also trust Jesus will avenge wrongs in this life. Like some of us, some of you maybe have been wronged severely. Like not just, okay, yeah, let that go. Like, like this has affected your life. You, you may have carry wounds and scars that will be with you to the day that you die. But know this, God will bring justice for those things. He will. He will make everything right on that final day. And then and finally, because God is going to judge, as Christians in his image and as bearing the, the word of God, we should still care about justice, right? There are things in our world like genocide and human trafficking and poverty that we should care about. Because God is just, we should work for justice. But ultimately, we can trust God is going to bring justice one day. And so then verse 14, God has judged the dead according to what's in the books. And look at the last enemy of God in verse 14. It says, then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. This is pretty cool. Death. What's the last thing Jesus ever destroys? It's death. What's the last enemy Jesus ever gets rid of? It's death. I mean, that was the first enemy that came when we sinned in Genesis. The very beginning, death came, and finally Jesus does away with death once and for all. No, no more death. In, in the new kingdom that we're going to start reading about, in the new heavens and the new earth, we don't have to be afraid, like, what if uh, an accident happens and you fall off a cliff? I don't know, but you're not going to die. I mean, just think about that. No more death. You will never, ever again experience death. No living thing will experience death. And that's good news, and that's actually bad news. Because what that means for everyone is that we, every single human, will live forever. I mean, just think about that. We are, we are literally like immortal. Every human, doesn't matter what you believe, you will live forever and ever and ever. And the question is, where, where will you live and that's where verse 15, it talks about it. And it says, if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. So right here, this, this is heavy. This is hell. This, this is defined faithfully as eternal conscious punishment for your sin. Where you, you're receiving the active wrath and punishment of God for every single sin. And Jesus, the, the fact is, Jesus talked about hell more than he talked about heaven. Jesus talked about hell more than any other biblical prophet talked about hell. Just in case you don't believe me, in Matthew 25 alone, one chapter, Jesus three different times talks about hell. And this is what he says. Verse 30, he says, and cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And then in another section, verse 41, he says, then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. And then finally, verse 46, it says, and those will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. And so Revelation 20, 15, it says, if your name is not written in Jesus' book of life, you will be thrown into hell forever. And so the most important question you could probably ever ask yourself 
is, is my name written in this book of life? Is my name in the book of life? Right? And, and our world has a lot of ideas. How do you get to heaven? How do you get your name in the book of life? The world kind of goes this route. You know what? You got to tally up enough good deeds. Maybe if it's a scale and you got to get a, you know, a few more good deeds than bad deeds. That's what our world says. Or our world says, you know, I don't even think about it. I don't even want to think about it. I don't even believe in it. And that's the, that's the other route our world goes. You know, I don't believe in hell. I don't believe that's going to happen. I don't believe a, a loving God could possibly ever send someone to hell. And so we just deny it altogether. But verse 15, you guys, this is the word of God. We have to submit to it. If your name is not found in the book of life, you will be thrown into the lake of fire. And, and right there, I mean, we should, we should. That should hit us. I mean, that should be a big deal. We should take a step back and, and just like, wow, hell, forever. And, and, and really wrestle with, man, could, like how could God do that? Like, that's, that's a real heavy reality in the Word of God. And the fact is, I mean, the Word is clear, and the, the Word says His ways are not our ways, and so there is a sense in which we, we won't get it. There's a sense in which it's beyond our mind, and we need to submit to it. But there is another sense in which we know God is perfectly holy, and God is perfectly just, right? And we get this. We understand justice. We understand it, it, like, if you steal candy from a little kid, you, you maybe could get away with it, right? But let's say you steal a gun from a policeman. You, you probably are going to get a little more justice there. Let's say you assassinate the president. Probably more justice, right? We understand that the, the, more, the greater the worth of the person that we're hurting, the greater the weight of, of judgment and justice upon us. We get that. A little kid to the president, you're going to get different justice. And the fact is that from the day we were born, we have been willfully rebelling against a perfect and holy God. Not, the, not just the president, not just a celebrity like God who created everything. We have been actively rebelling against him. And we, 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 can, we have to get, he is justice and he is just and he is holy. And he would not be a loving, good God to let that justice go, to just sweep it under the rug. But there's another question worth asking besides, like, why would God let people go to hell? There's another question. That's a good question. That's a question we should be ready to talk about. That's a question we should have a defense for when, when our, our friends and our family who aren't believers ask us that. That's one we should even wrestle with. But there's another question, and it's this. Why would God rescue those justly condemned to hell? Or this way, why would God bear the weight of sin on his back and let sinners go free? Like that, that's another question we should think about. Because what's truly amazing isn't, isn't that people would get what they deserve. Like that actually makes sense. What's amazing is that some people wouldn't get what they deserve. What's amazing is if, if someone's on death row, that they, someone would come and say, do you know what, go free. Do you know what, let me take your place instead. You're condemned to die, and I'll die in your place. What's the most amazing truth in, in history is that God himself would come and would bear the weight of every sinner on his back, and he would receive the wrath of God. He would receive eternal punishment on the cross for sinners who didn't ask for it, who were rebelling against him and killed him. Hell is, hell is a devastating truth, and we see it here. And Jesus went to the cross to experience hell in our behalf. I mean, think about that. Jesus suffered every, every drop of punishment that we deserve. Jesus took that for us. Therefore, and we know this, if your faith is in Jesus, if your faith is in Jesus, your name is in the book. Wrath, hell has been poured out on Christ, and you have been given salvation and forgiveness. And that's, that's what we have to remember when we're talking about hell. That's what should be so quickly on our lips as we, as we speak to our friends and our family about God and about hell and about justice, is yes, we can't back down on what the Word of God teaches. We cannot back down that yes, there will come a day of reckoning. 
But what we should be so quick to tell them is that God in his love took that punishment for them. And that if you confess your sin and you confess your need for forgiveness, God will forgive you and, you, and your name would be written in this book. And so this morning, I, I just, is your faith in Christ? Do you rest in what Jesus has done for you? And if not, it's not about this stuff. It's not about what you can do and how you can prove yourself and how you can be better and change your life. That's not what it's about. It's about trusting in what Jesus has taken for you. So this morning, if, if, that's, if you've never done that, by faith, literally, all it takes is a surrender to Jesus. Jesus, I admit that, that there are things in my life that deserve punishment, but you went to the cross on my behalf. I believe that. I trust in that. And he says, you will be saved, and your name will be written in the book of life. John 3, 6, Jesus himself says, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. And this morning, let's just, let's reflect, let's know this. If your name is written in the book of life, if your name is in the book of life, there's no more condemnation for you. Romans 8, 1, we know that there is no more condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So just let that sink in. As the dread and the fear of the end of the world and hell kind of like simmers in our mind, no, you've already been condemned in Christ. Think about that. You, there is no more condemnation for you. God would be unjust to punish your sin on Christ and then punish you again in your life. If you're experiencing hardship or suffering or circumstances, know this, it's not the wrath of God on you. If you put your trust in Christ, the wrath has already been poured out. You are a beloved son and daughter of God. There is no more condemnation. Because you're a son or daughter, you may experience discipline and you may experience chastisement. You may experience hardship, but that's God's love for you. Like a, a good mom or dad who are going to spank their child because they love them. The kid's running to go play in the street. Like You may experience some pain and discipline, but out of love. And that is what you're experiencing. You are not experiencing the wrath of God. Know that. No more Condemnation, another one that, that I love, especially to our youth, this is constant. No more, every accusation the enemy brings against you, you can say, my name is written in the book of life. Every time the enemy comes to you and says, hey, remember that sin, look what you have done, and starts lying to you about your identity, lying to you about that final day, maybe you won't stand, maybe you will go to hell. What I love is we can, we can take that opportunity to thank Satan Say, Satan, thank you for reminding me where my sin is. It's on the cross. That's where you lost. Every time Satan condemns us, every time he accuses us, we can remember, my name is in the book of life. All the condemnation was poured out on Christ. There's no more fear of punishment. We don't have to be afraid of God punishing us. There's no more fear of death. I mean, we will face death. And it will be difficult and it will be hard, but we know that death will be defeated and Jesus conquered death. We don't have to prove ourselves anymore. I mean, that's every day of our existence is like, let me prove myself to my friends, to my parents, to my boss. Like, I have to prove myself. Did you know that Jesus proved himself for you on your behalf, that you are approved of now as a son or daughter, that yes, your life has You've failed and you've sinned and you have not, you've come up short, but you are also clothed in the righteous robes of Jesus. And God looks at you right now and he approves of you. Just think about that. God approves of you. When he thinks of you, he smiles. He approves of you now. And that frees us, God willing, from having to prove ourselves to people, from having to prove ourselves to that on that final day. God has been, he's been so good to us in his son. Yes. Hell is a real reality. Hell is coming. But Jesus, Jesus says, come to me. Come to me, put your faith in me, and I will receive your punishment. And so this morning, we have an opportunity to enact this last day. Because at this last day, every knee is going to bow. Regardless of what you believe, what you don't believe. Every knee will see Jesus and they will bow to him. And, and the choice is ours. Will you bow to him this morning or will you bow to him 
on that day? Will you willingly worship at his feet? Will you praise him and submit to him and worship him? And if, and if you won't, be assured one day, the day is coming when you will bow. You won't have that choice. But this morning, we have that opportunity. We have the opportunity to say, Jesus, thank you that you took, you took the depths and the punishment and the wrath of God for me. That way I can come and bow willingly and worship him. So this morning, let's worship him. Let's bow our knee to him. This morning, if, if, if you have fear in your heart, if you have fear about that last day, come to Jesus. Come to him. He will take away your fear. He has taken away your punishment. If you have never bowed your knee, my prayer is this morning that you would bow your knee. You would submit to Christ. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for who you are and what you have done on our behalf. Yes, Lord, hell is coming. There will be a reckoning, God. And, and Lord, that should create this sense in us of, man, there are people who don't know you yet. There are people who haven't bowed their knee. There are people who are not protected by the blood of Jesus, Lord. And, and I pray that that would lead us, Lord, that would lead us to plead with our families and our friends to come to Christ. God, that we wouldn't dull the sharp edges of your word, but that we would submit to it and we would allow it to work, God. And then, Lord, if we have, if we've trusted in you, Jesus, I pray that you would, you would remove fear. You would remove the need for us to prove ourselves. You would remind us of your great, infinite love for us, that you are separated from your Father so that we didn't have to be. Thank you for the cross, Lord. I pray this morning you would help us to see what kind of a God we have, that he would leave his throne, he would get off his throne, and he would humble himself. Lord, I pray this morning you would allow us to come and just worship you, to thank you for the cross, to thank you for what you have done on our behalf. Help us, give us fresh eyes to see the love of God. Give us fresh eyes to see the justice and holiness of God. Help us to worship you now, Jesus. Amen.